What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Let's Play Mega Man X5. Last episode, the Enigma Shop failed, so now we have to rely on the backup plan to destroy the plummeting space colony and avert an imminent disaster. We're going to be starting off with Zero to give us a chance to show him off a little bit. He plays pretty similarly to how we did in X4, even as most of the same inputs, most of the same moves. Some of them are palette swaps. I'll show them off just as soon as we get Aaliyah's asinine dialogue out of the way in the very beginning because it wouldn't be X5 without Aaliyah talking our ear off. So we have our Kuenbu. I think it's, uh, it's like the Crescent Sword or something in this one. The main difference here between X5 and X4 is that Zero can fire his own Z-Buster this time. Uh, that's pretty much Cyber, the weapon you get from Cyber Peacock. He has this cool little uh, dash ability. Dark Dizzy stage here is very, very laggy for the first half of it. The frame rate just kind of dips in and out. So, what I've been meaning to talk about a bunch since uh, since I started this playthrough are all of the, the brand new mechanics and the way they interact with, with each other in X5. And I haven't gotten a real good solid chance to do that just yet. So, I'm, I'm gonna try to talk straight through that while I'm going through Dark Dizzy stage. Before I do that, though, there is one tricky part of the stage coming up in a moment that I'm that I need to uh, to concentrate a little bit for. So the deal with the stage is you see all these constellations popping up, and you have uh, this black hole that occasionally pops up in the background art of the stage. The way the stage works, or at least the way the first half of the stage works, is that oops, when the constellations pop up, you're on a timer. It's a global timer, and when that timer ticks down, it the uh, the black hole pops back up in the background. This is why I kind of need to... Ooh, spike. When... Hold on. There we go. When the black hole pops back up, after the constellations are in the background, it spawns a whole bunch of bats and a couple spike traps. The spikes do not kill you instantly if they fall on you. If you step on top of them, or if you're on the floor after your, uh, your invulnerability frames from being hit, if you're still on the ground, walking around, they will kill you instantly. So you can you can let them fall on you, that's fine. What I want to start off with talking about uh, mechanics-wise for X5 that I haven't gotten a good chance to talk about yet, though, is we'll start off with this the floating virus Sigma heads and the, your, the status indicator we see in the bottom left of the screen. The deal with that is that when you get hit by one of these purple floating Sigma Virus heads, that indicator, uh, normally that indicator in the bottom left changes to reflect that you've been hit. This looks like a tr uh, tricky jump, it's not. It changes to indicate that you've been hit by a, by a virus head. And the way that the virus affects you depends on whether or not you're playing as X or Zero. If you take, I think it's Four hits by a virus head as X, you get poisoned, which means you start taking damage over time. If you take the same amount of hits as zero and you get infected, zero becomes invincible. And that's until, that's for both of them, until the status eventually resets back down to normal. Or until you die in a stage, complete a stage, or enter one of Dr. Light's capsules, which I think there was one right before the boss door, but I can't get it yet as zero. Dark Dizzy is a pushover of a fight, one, because I'm using zero, two, because he doesn't really attack all that often and his attacks aren't hard to dodge. Oh, wow, that's, he doesn't do that too often. Getting shades of Shade Man from him. Yeah, so he'll occasionally swoop down, grab you, drain a little bit of your health to replenish his own. It does not look like he's gonna, oh, Okay, he did get another attack off. I don't know how many of attacks of his we're actually going to get to see. Oh, I didn't even mean for the uh, that little dash attack to complete it. I was hoping he would at least show off Dark Hold, which is one of his cooler attacks. Dark Hold is a time stop ability, and it's the ability that you get for completing the fight. And it's... Possibly one of the best, one of the most useful abilities in all of the X series, because again, it's a time stop. And the way that Darkhold functions when you use it when you're playing as X, 
it freezes all enemies and all uh, all effects going on on screen around you and your energy bar slowly drains down your weapon energy slowly drains down while it's in while that effect is active and the only way to cancel out of it is to switch weapons oh right and we have dynamo again so let's go ahead and deal with dynamo um that's probably the last time I'm gonna be using zero depending on what happens when I get when I gather the uh, the last of the two remaining parts from Matrix and uh, Matt Rex, I mean, and Axel the Red, depending on what happens after I launch the shuttle at the colony, I might be using Zero again for one more boss fight that's way, way, way easier with Zero than it is with X. Come on, Dynamo. So this, this version of the Dynamo fight is pretty much exactly the same as it was when we fought him the first time. He has one new attack. I am the worst person in the world at dodging this uh, this new attack. We're gonna see how I fare with it. Ah. Uh. So he always repeats that same pattern when he does that attack. His, him telegraphing the attack is... There we go. His fist starts to glow that kind of blue-green color and punches the ground. It's always back wall, forward wall. The thing that makes it so hard to dodge is that first one, though. Ah, shit. This fight is not going well for me. I even have the quick charge from Squid Adler active. That's, that might be the only thing that really saves me, is I can end this before he can kill me. Ah, damn it. You get a very, very small window of time before the beams become active. Oh, damn! I almost had the chance to make it through there unscathed, but I missed the two easy sets of beams to dodge. Okay. He's also- Dynamo knows that this is my weakness too, that this is my kryptonite. I jumped into it. He knows this is my kryptonite, otherwise he wouldn't be doing it so much. It's completely random how often he does that attack. That went really poorly. Luckily I had so much health built up and had a couple extra parts giving me the assist on that one. Okay, so more about the mechanics of the game. I'm talking a little bit about the shuttle and the Eurasia colony and all, and all of this stuff. I haven't really elaborated on the way all of these subsystems in the game work and interact with each other. And there are a lot of them. Which makes the game pretty uh, pretty unique and it's it can be kind of complicated to get to really dig into. Especially when you're talking about 100%ing the game. Now, like I said, I've hinted or alluded to a lot of this stuff, but I haven't gone into enough detail that I think makes what I'm doing here for the 100% really all that clear. Okay, so there's a lot going on. There's the timer, there's the timer that you all know about that lets you know when the Eurasian colony is about to crash into the Earth. It starts off at 16 hours. Every time you enter a stage, it ticks down by one hour, so you have to gather all of the parts you need from the bosses in that time span in order to save the Earth. Now, there are eight bosses plus two dynamo fights, so that's ten hours. That leaves you uh, plenty of breathing room, except that the timer interacts with another system. Bosses in X5 have levels, as you might have noticed, uh, under their health bars. Actually, I think I've actually explained that a little bit. So it interacts with the boss levels. The higher the boss level, the more health the boss has. Bosses' levels are increased in the following ways. The lower the timer, the higher the boss level. That's the most obvious one. That's one of the, the ones we rely most on manipulating for this run-through, for this playthrough. Defeating a Maverick makes subsequent bosses go up by one level. Finally, your hunter rank increases boss level, so that ranking you get at the end of a level, plus the, the ranking you see- Oh shit, I forgot the lava spawns right away! Uh, that's not good. Um, where was I? So, the, the hunter rank is not only the ranking that you get at the very beginning of a stage, you also saw a ranking at the very beginning at the character select from the- right before the intro stage. Zero starts off with a hunter rank of SA. X. Oh, Jesus Christ, why do I suck so hard at this right now? This is unnaturally bad. 
So X starts off with a rank of B, Zero starts with SA. And those rankings, right off the bat, increased the boss levels. That's why I started off with Zero and sacrificed having the uh, X's armor from X4 for the rest of the game. If you go into a stage and you're ranked SA, bosses are two levels higher than they would normally be. GA, they're four levels higher, I think, and so on. I think the highest one is PA. You raise your hunter rank by completing stages quickly and destroying as many enemies as possible while also not taking damage. But here's the relevant part for 100%ing this. Bosses have to be at least level 8 to drop a bonus or a plus armor part. That's when you get to the end of a boss fight and you get to pick between uh, life or energy uh, plus. That little plus mark at the end, you only see that when bosses are level 8 or higher, and that's what gives you an extra part once you beat them. So that's... I don't know if anyone else defines the 100% for X5 that way, but I... If there's a way to achieve that, then I, I consider it that way. I consider 100% to be as many of those bonus Maverick parts as possible, which is 8 out of 16, because you have, again, two choices per, uh, per Maverick, 8 Mavericks, 16 possible items you can get, but you can only get 18 in one playthrough. Or, I mean, 18. You can only get 8 in one playthrough. So that's what makes the timer so important. The timer and your ranking, and which is basically just for the purposes of manipulating boss levels, uh, the only real choice you can make is to start off with zero. You can do it with X. X gives you less breathing room, though. I think I'm, I, I'm either going to end this with zero hours left till the colony falls into into uh, the Earth, or I'm going to end it with one hour. I, I didn't look at the timer before I went into this stage. Oh, by the way, what I'm doing here, there are two routes from where you see where you saw the ride armor. Uh, if you take the bottom route here, which is through the lava, then you skip a mini-boss, which is not that bad. I don't like doing this route, though, because it's too easy to jump out into the lava and instantly die because of the way the ride armor handles. I've always had that issue with jumping out of the ride armor prematurely and getting myself killed. In, like, in, in every X game, it controls pretty much the same way. Which is weird, because X's head is clearly poking out of the suit. It's not protected, but you only die once you jump out. Anyway, though, um, other subsystems, I'm pretty sure I explained this. The bosses on the left side of the stage select give the parts that you need for the Enigma Cannon. The bosses on the right side give the parts you need for the shuttle. They only increase the chances for either one of those to succeed in destroying the colony enough so for it to not devastate the Earth. You never have a 100% chance of the Enigma Cannon or the shuttle succeeding. You can succeed without a single part for either of them, but the chances of that happening are very, very low, whereas you get a much better chance at either one of those if you get all four parts for each of them. Also, real quick, some people think that the more lives you have, the better your chances of succeeding, but that's almost certainly bullshit. It's random, just like all those old World of Warcraft. Uh, Nixia deep breaths more if scenarios. Uh, the patch causes Oni to deep breath more. Oni deep breaths more if you have eight warlocks or more in your party. Stuff like that. It's... It's purely random. There's no way to actually manipulate that except to get the parts. Alright, so those systems took less time than I thought they would to explain, and I can focus on fighting the boss now. Actually... Yeah, I guess there is one more thing I can talk about real quick. A couple of stages, about half of them, I think, have Reploids that we can rescue. None of the ones are going to be featured in this episode. Let's see, because we have Matrex, Dizzy, and Axel. This yeah, we got all the Reploids taken, taken care of already. I got all of them except one that got stuck in the wall, and I'll probably see him again anyway when I backtrack through Duff McWhalen's stage. I don't strictly consider them part of the 100%. And I can't even remember if they actually respawn like extra lives, so yeah. In X6, I will consider them part of, a, of the 100% though, because they do a lot more in that game. All they do in X5 is they give you an extra life and some health. So, so far, 
Matt Rex is Matt Matt Rex, like T Rex, is going smooth-ish, smoother than. Oh damn it! Getting caught off guard by his attack banners. Was going smoother than Dynamo, but I don't know about that anymore. Though I'm taking a lot of hits from dumb stuff. Dodged at that time, at least. That's a lot. That one's a lot easier to dodge than Dynamo's version of the attack. Her pillars or columns just pop up from the ground. And yet I'm still managing to not avoid it. Holy shit. Oh man, I, I just have to end that. So the extra Maverick part you get from Matt Rex. Okay, I'm just calling him Burn Dino Rex because that's his original name anyway. The extra part that you get from him. If you choose the Life Plus, is your projectiles fly faster. If you choose Energy Plus, you get an upgrade for the X Buster and for Zero's version of the Buster. That increases the damage pretty substantially, which is kind of making me regret not having done him very early in the game, if not first, because that would have sped everything else up significantly. But mistakes were made. We move on to Axel Rose. Wait a minute, that's not his name, is it? Axel the Red, <laughs> whose namesake in the English version or in the English version is pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah, so he's obviously named after Axel Rose in the English version. I explained why all the characters, all the bosses, I mean, are named after Guns and Roses. I was gonna call them characters, band members. Uh, last episode, Axel the Red was is. His origins are pretty cool because his design was partially inspired by Kakuin from JoJo's. And his original name in... Well, what what it should have been translated as is Spike Rose Red. Actually, that might have been the name in Japanese. I don't remember. Or for the Japanese version. Oh, and before I forget, Dark Dizzy was named after... Oh, who was he named after? Uh, Dizzy Reed, a keyboardist, I think. His original name was Dark Necrobat. Dark Dizzy. I can't. I can't decide which is the worst name: Dark Dizzy or Dark Necrobat. Messing around with uh, Izzy's weapon. I have a couple uses for that in mind later on. I never realized Gel Shaver didn't do like, any damage at all. It's kind of pathetic. It's one of my least favorite weapons. Yeah, here we go with the Dark Hold. So, Dark Hold is the only weapon in the game, the only special weapon. Actually, it's not just in the game, it's throughout the entire series that cannot be charged. It doesn't have a charged variation, it just does the same thing every time. I'm gonna be using Dark Hold to bypass uh, some annoying parts of this level in just a moment. Actually, it's coming up after a few of these rope sections here. Just have to remember which one. You know what? I have enough energy left on it that I could just use it right now. And bypass a majority of the headache. Oh, here it is. So, what happens to me a lot here is that there, is, there are one of those vine tentacle things embedded in the ceiling above the rope I just dashed past. What usually happens to me there is it winds up protruding and knocking me off the rope and getting me sent to my death, and I just didn't want to put up with that. So instead, we Zawarudo! And just bypass it easily. Now we can move on to the final of the eight Mavericks we're going to be facing in X5. And he is... Axel the Red. Who has... One of the coolest entrances in the entire game. Comes in on a giant bed of a rose. <laughs> the way this fight works is he uh, is a little bit like a little bit like Split Mushroom in the most minor of ways. He's not nearly as annoying to fight as Split Mushroom is. He's not nearly as technical. So he's also uh as far as the game goes, he's probably got one of the most simple attack patterns out of any boss. He doesn't really change things up much as the fight goes on. Which isn't to say that he can't uh, 
He can't do a lot of damage to you real quick, but... Oh, man. Looks like I can't destroy the purple ball as soon as it pops out of his hand. So he fires two spike balls out of his hand. One of them is green, and that one he fires in a straight line. It embeds itself in the wall for a short period of time. The other one is the purple spike ball, which is the one that bounces all around the room, and you can destroy that to make, it, uh, to make the fight a little bit less hectic. Not that it's necessary, though. The, his phase two is pretty fun with the, all the roses floating across the ceiling. Fortunately, they don't last too long. Now it's just a simple matter of finishing this off. He's not going to get a second one of those. So if you get hit by his whip attack, his thorn rose whip thing, it constricts you for a little bit and he will slowly deal damage to you over the time. I think you can either mash or waggle out of it. He does twice the amount of damage if both he and his clone hit you with that at the same time, so that's why I was just chilling out on the wall. I think you can destroy the rose petals that float across the screen. You will take less damage if you uh, if you just chill out on the wall, taking the hits from the roses that fall to the floor, than if you're on the ground trying to deal with uh, the whips from both him and his twin. Okay, so now we are going to launch the shuttle at the Eurasia Colony Zero. For some reason, is the only person qualified to pilot it. Remember, there's no autopilot on it. So we're going to see now. This is the moment of fate that's going to decide what we experience going into the end game. Who else? Who who else will protect the Earth? I don't know, but I mean you're. You're technically ranked higher as a Maverick Hunter, even though the game is about me, so maybe X should be piloting it? Again, the only, like, qualified pilot somehow. The only one left. I don't- I don't know how that could possibly be, but... Contrivances for the sake of the plot. Alright, blast off. And now we will decide. It is crushed into the colony. We did everything, blah blah blah. So, did we destroy the colony? The destruction rate is 54%. That's not enough. It won't be destroyed. Okay, so now something pretty interesting is going to happen. We did all that work for nothing. A few things can happen with the colony. You can get it out of the way with the Enigma shot. If that happens, the game tells you that only 80-some percent of it was destroyed, the colony that is. The rest of it crashes into the Earth and you get what's playing out right now. You can fail the Enigma shot and succeed with the shuttle, and the result is the same as what I just described. Actually, no, it's not. I'm, I am I had a bit of a brain fart. If the Enigma shot succeeds, 14% or so of the colony that remains intact still crashes into the Earth. It still spreads the virus that was on the colony around the Earth, and it merges with the virus that was, again, on the Earth already, creates a new virus. That stuff is still going to happen, it's just this the implications of widespread destruction and all that. Not quite as intense if you succeed, and again, you can succeed with the shuttle after the Enigma shot has failed. The result is pretty much the same as what I was just talking about. Zero, the, the main difference in that scenario, if you succeed with one of those two shots, Zero will survive completely unscathed, nothing weird happens, but the remnants of the colony still crash, and the rest remains pretty much the same. If you fail both, this is, like I did, this is where things get kind of interesting. A significant chunk of the colony strikes the Earth, causing untold devastation, and Zero becomes a maverick, as we're now seeing. The canonical scenario here is that the shuttle succeeds, and X6 is proof of this. If you let time run out, then the Eurasia colony hits the Earth and humanity barely survives, and Zero also becomes a maverick in that situation. Pretty much you have two things that can happen. You can either succeed with the shuttle or with the Enigma shot. Everything is cool, Zero survives that, and you will be able to use him for the rest of the game if you so choose or you can wait the timer out, or you can fail both the shuttle and the Enigma shot, and this happens. Zero turns Maverick, and he is 
unavailable to play as for the rest of the game, which makes one of the bosses coming up in a little bit a little bit more of a pain in the ass because X is not well suited to that boss fight. That's going to do it for this episode. Next episode, we are going to play cleanup crew and go backtrack through all the stages in which we missed items, which is all of them. We're going to complete the Gaia armor and the Falcon armor and get all the remaining hearts and tanks. And then we will move on to the end game. So until then, thanks for watching everyone. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you're not subscribed already, drop me a comment, I read all of them and respond to most of them. Thanks for watching everyone, take it easy, have a good one.